Good evening. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church School and Preschool. We are happy to have you here for, well, holy cow, it's the fifth Sunday in Lent. Moving right along. Easter's just around the corner. So, before we get to announcements, I want to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to our Zion Bell Choir. Thank you, Bells. It's fantastic to have you back. Speaking of coming back, Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. Sunday morning. We're coming back. We will have communion at the rails. Passing the plates. We will still have, going forward, a Saturday night COVID-friendly service for those of you that still want the masks and still want the precautions. We will still have that going forward. But if you're missing the rails, that will come back Easter morning. Also coming back is choir. If you would like to sing, CK, she would love to have you. If you don't like to sing, CK, she'd love to have you. The more voices, the better. Okay. Coming up, we will have our last midweek service this week. Um, 10 o'clock, midweek chapel, kind of geared towards the kids, but a fantastic service. We'd love to have any and all of you. That evening, 5.30 meal, followed by 6.15 service. We will be talking about returning to the kingdom of God. So please join us for that. Also coming up, men's retreat. The 
Board of Lay Ministry will be having their annual uh, retreat. But that Saturday, Saturday starting at breakfast, working almost to lunch, we'd like the men of the congregation, and really the men of the community, to come join us. We're going to have Mike Allsteel, if you know that man. He's a he's local minister in the area, has a strong men's ministry. He's going to talk to us about what it means to be a man in the home, a man in the church, a man in your community, what it means to be a man of God. So please join us for that. Put that on your calendars May 1st. For your school kids, the butter bread pickup, it will be this Wednesday. So keep that, keep that in mind. Also, let your neighbors know preschool registration opens up for the community on Monday. So if you've got a, a preschooler in your neighborhood and they need a place to go, send them to Hope, Hope Ginslinger. She'll sign them up for preschool. Preschool registration for the community starts Monday. Last announcement I have, Sunday school helpers are needed. If you would like to be, uh, like to help out with Sunday school, we'd love to have you. We need a, a leader and a guide. A guide really just moves the kids from one spot to another. This is, we talk about what it means to be a Christian man, what it means to be a man of God, what it means to be an adult in the congregation. These little kids look up to you. They need to know that you care about them and their growth and their faith. One of the best ways to do that is just to spend time with them. So, if you would like to, even if you wouldn't like to, but feel called to, go see Lorian. She would love to have you for Sunday school. The need's somewhat pressing. We need, a, we need a couple people by next week. So if you could, get in touch with her soon. We need help. All right, I think that's all I've got. Anybody else have any announcements for the congregation? Pastor? Yes, Roxy. Just a big Great. Thank you to the congregation for all your work for the blood drive. Thank you to Roxy and, and Allison Flaherty for all the work they do to put that together. 16 weeks, right? Is the next one? Yes, July 6th. July 6th, so put that on your calendar. Next blood drive, July 6th. Thank you. Anything else? Great. Let's stand and greet each other in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't forget to say hi to the people playing at home. Hello.
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave for all. Bearing our sins and in need of a Savior, let us go to our Heavenly Father asking for forgiveness. Most merciful Heavenly Father, you promised a covenant written on your people's hearts, but we do not always rely on your promises and great love. We are sorry. Gracious Holy Spirit, through your use of word and sacrament, many people know the Lord, but we have not taken advantage of every opportunity to share your word with others. We are sorry. Jesus taught that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. But our hearts have not always been humble and eager for service. We are sorry. Our thoughts, words, and deeds fall short. As fallen sinners, we all are helpless to change. For Jesus' sake, forgive us and give us new and clean hearts to love you and serve our neighbors. God promised in the new covenant, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And the sacrifice of himself, Jesus being perfect, became the source of eternal salvation. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, who has revealed to us your great love in Christ our Savior and written your covenant on our hearts, grant us such faith that our daily joy is sharing your love and what we think, say, and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Go ahead and grab your Bibles or your Bible Acts. We begin with our readings from Jeremiah 31, which will be the basis of today's message. The Old Testament reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading can be found in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 10. The reading from Hebrews chapter 5. 
For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only one called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of the flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who will obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. <coughs> Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. We're in Mark chapter 10, starting with the 32nd verse. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking, taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was, what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I will be, that I, with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those to, for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began, to be, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Together we make our common confession of faith found in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead. This kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together in his worship and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated and the children to come forward for the children's message. Something. Hello! There we go. There is something, at least. Who here has ever read Alexander in the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day? None of you have read this classic in American literature? Parents, Alexander in the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Yes! Guess what it's about? Sarah, guess what it's about? Might it be about a... It is about a very good, very good. It is about a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. One bad thing happens to Alexander after another. And you know what he wants to do? I just want to move to Australia, he says. I don't know. But at the end, his mom tells him that Australia's, Australians have a very, have terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days too. I bet you guys have once, or twice maybe, had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Holland has, yeah. Sarah has. Ethan, have you ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? I know I have, right? We've all had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. But at the end of the day, right, we still pray. We still pray. And what's in our prayers? Do we still say thank you for stuff? Even when things have been terrible, horrible, and no good, and very bad, there's still stuff to say thank you for? There's always stuff to be thankful for. Even if everything gets taken away, even if our house burns down to the ground and our, our kitchens are empty and we get grounded for, a, for five years. Have I ever been grounded for five years? I've come close. But even if all that bad stuff happens, we still have something to be thankful for. Because no matter what happens, Jesus is coming back, right? He's coming back and he's taking all that terrible, horrible, no good, very bad stuff and he's getting rid of it. So we can live in a world that's perfect. Where there's nothing terrible, there'll be nothing horrible, everything will be good, and bad won't even be a word. I can't wait till that happens. I can't wait till he comes back. What about you? Yeah? Great. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that there's bad days when things just don't go our way. But even when those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days happen, Lord, we know we can always say thank you because we always have your Son. And there will be a day when he will return and all things will be made right. We thank you in his name. And all God's kids said, Amen. You may return to your seats. We continue with our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I love that hymn. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Now I ask you, I ask the kids, have you ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? You were all liars. Come on. Have you ever had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? I have, right? Things where nothing goes right. Where you open up the newspaper and Rapid City PD is saying robberies and homicides and vehicle thefts and, and aggravated assaults are going through the roof. Where you turn on the TV and you want to see what's going on in the world and they keep on telling you that there's one more peaceful protest burning the city down or storming the Capitol building. Those days when the car won't start, the dishwasher is flooding the kitchen, the kids have put another hole in the drywall, but that's okay because it matches the hole in the carpet the dog put in there the day before. There are times when you are in the middle of a terrible, no good, very bad, horrible day. And then you have to sing a song that says, give thanks for a grateful, with a grateful heart. Give thanks for what? Everything seems to be going wrong. On those days when everything seems to be going wrong, pray. Open the Bible. Specifically, open up to Jeremiah. Because if there's anybody in the Bible that can teach us about a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, it's Jeremiah, who didn't have just one day, but had a whole lifetime of that. He had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad life. To understand why Jeremiah's life's so bad, we're going to have to do a little bit of history lesson which I kind of like because I'm a history guy and the rest of you just have to go along for the ride. But, history lesson. So Jeremiah is a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah, mainly Jerusalem, in the 6th century BC. Right? But to understand why he's there and what he's got to tell the people, we got to go back 800 years to start our history lesson off. We got to go back to about 1450 BC. 1450 B.C., the people of Israel aren't the people, well, they're, they're, they're Hebrew people, and they're the slaves in Egypt, and God says, those people are mine. I made a promise to their fathers, and I've come to fulfill that promise, and he gathers up his people, brings them out of Egypt, the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the ten commandments that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Ten commandments. They receive them on Mount Sinai, right? Moses goes up in the cloud, receives the commandments, comes down. That's the covenant. God says, you do this, and I am your God, and you're my people. Here's, here's your part of the covenant. Here's your part of the deal. We'll talk about how well that covenant went here in a few minutes. But they leave Mount Sinai, they go to the Promised Land, detour, let's do 40 years, spin in circles, and then we go back to the Promised Land 40 years later. And now the 12 tribes of Israel are ushered into the Promised Land, land flowing with milk and honey, everything's great, land of overabundance. They each get their separate spot of land, Dan's up here, Nephtali's, all the rest of them, right? But they're 12 separate tribes. They go through the cycle of the judges, and then, then they say, God, we want our own king. Just like everybody else, we want our own king to unify us, to bring us together. And God says, well, that's kind of my job. And they say, well, you're great, but we want someone like everybody else. And so God says, okay. And through Samuel, the last judge, they anoint Saul. Saul becomes the first king of Israel, and he unifies the 12 tribes, or the 12 tribes are unified through his reign, to form the, the one nation of Israel. For the first time, these 12 tribes, these 12 separate tribes are one, geographically, physically, politically. That's 
It's about 1050 BC. Things go well for Saul, then things go bad for Saul. God chooses another king, he chooses David. Things go well for David, things go bad for David. Then David turns it over to his son Solomon, and things go well for Solomon, and things go bad for Solomon. But for these three, Saul, David, and Solomon, the kingdom remains united. It's one nation of Israel. But the wheels fall off with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. See, Solomon was pretty harsh with the people. He used them for slave labor to build his beautiful temple. Right? The temple in Jerusalem was really built. Maybe not slave, but it was slave wages at least. And Jeroboam, this guy representing the ten northern tribes, comes to Rehoboam and says, Hey man, your dad was pretty harsh. Could you lighten up a little bit? It would go a long way for the people if you would just ease up. Rehoboam wanted to appear tough. He wanted to appear in control. And he said, if you thought dad was tough, wait till you get a load of me. And Jeroboam says, I don't have to wait. I'm out. And he gathers up the 10 tribes of 10 of those 12 tribes. And they say, you and your Davidic line, you're nuts. We're out. So now we have two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now we've got about 200 years of, of an Israeli Cold War. They fight, they don't fight, they're friends, they're not friends. It lasts till about 722 BC when God has warned them over and over and over again to knock off your nonsense, knock off the sin. I gave you 10 rules. Follow those ten rules. Go back to your side of the covenant. But they kept messing up. They kept sinning. They kept breaking their side of the covenant. So God says, okay, I've warned you. Now it's time to show you. And he sends in the Assyrian Empire to the northern kingdoms, northern kingdom of Israel and wipes them off the face of the planet. The way the Assyrians would, what they would do when they conquered a land, they would take all the people in the land, they would, dis they would disperse them around their kingdom, right? So they couldn't rise up and rebel, you know, they'd be scattered. With that scattering, they were lost. So if you've ever heard of the ten lost tribes of Israel, it's the northern kingdom of Israel and they're still lost to this day. Well, Assyria wasn't quite done. They figured that since things went so well in the northern kingdom, let's just go on. Let's keep going to the southern kingdom. And they get almost the entire thing conquered. They've got their entire army surrounding the last stronghold, which is the walls of Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah gets on his knees and prays to the God, prays to God, Lord, save us. And he did. The night before the Assyrians were to attack, God just decimated their ranks. They went to sleep awake, or they went to sleep alive, and they didn't wake up. God saved the southern kingdom there in 722 to live another day. They fell back in their old sinful ways. Hezekiah was a good king, but his son wasn't. More sinful kings, more sinful people, and God continues to warn them, Stop! You've got ten rules to follow. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You've got ten rules to follow. It's your side of the covenant. It's what you're responsible for. I've got everything else. Just follow those ten rules and we're good. And they didn't. So we come to the prophet Jeremiah and his terrible, horrible, no good, very bad life. We got a couple of quotes that we like to pull from Jeremiah. I, I, I know the plans I have for you. Before, before you were in the womb, I knew you. And those are very true. God did know Jeremiah. He knew exactly what Jeremiah was going to do before he was even born, before he was even conceived. And it wasn't going to be fun. 
Because no longer is God sending prophets to tell them to stop doing what they're doing. Now, Jeremiah's message is this. You guys have messed up. You have sinned and you have angered God and now it's time to take your punishment. Just like the Assyrians were the punishment for the northern tribes, Assyria has been now replaced by Babylon and Babylon is your punishment. It's time for you to take it. Now here's the thing. Who here was spanked as a child? Yep, I was. A lot. <laughs> and when, when five-year-old Brian would do something bad, I'd hear mom yelling from the other room, come here for your spanking. You know what my response was? Nope. <laughs> you better come here and take it like a man. Nope. If you want to spank me, you got to catch me. Right? There's no way I didn't want to be punished. I don't want to be, no one likes being smacked across the backside. People of the southern kingdom of Judah are no different. They didn't want to get punished. And so here they've got a guy who's screaming at them of all the things they've done wrong and how a punishment is coming. How well do you think they took it? Who's here heard the phrase, don't beat the messenger? Yeah? The people of the southern kingdom of Judah had never heard that phrase because they beat the tar out of Jeremiah. You see, God knew what was in store for Jeremiah. He knew his fate for telling the people that punishment was coming. But despite the beatings and despite the protests and despite, despite Jeremiah's warning that it was coming, the people never relented. And in 609... B.C., the powerhouse of the area, the Babylonian Empire, comes in. And they conquered the southern kingdom of Judah in a mostly peaceful conquest. Unlike the Assyrians before them, the Babylonians saw no need to disperse the people. They figured they'd just take the best and the brightest. Right? If we take their leadership, the people will fall in line. Side note, this is where we get to the story of David, or Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come from this time. They're part of that first group that's taken up to Babylon to serve the Babylonians. But Jeremiah stays because the people still haven't got the message. They rebel again against Jeremiah's prophetic warning. They rebel again. They remove the Babylonian puppet king. In 597 BC, the Babylonians say enough and they come down a little harder this time, a little less peaceful. They deport more of the leadership to Babylon, thinking, okay, those leaders weren't doing it. You've got more leaders. If we take away all your leaders, the rest of you will fall in line. And Jeremiah says, there, let that be it. Fall in line, take the rest of our punishment, and things will be better. They didn't listen. For a third time, they rebelled. They killed the puppet king. Babylon this time came down with a bloody and crushing blow. They carted off all but a fragment of the city's population and the southern kingdom's population. They destroyed the walls around Jerusalem. They demolished homes and shops. And they desecrated and decimated Solomon's temple, tore it to the ground and removed everything of value. Think about that. I love this church. I love this building. Think of people running through it and ransacking it and burning it to the ground. And here's Jeremiah the entire time. This is all God's will, people. And as you're watching your temple, your church burn to the ground, as you're watching your house be destroyed, as you're watching the Babylonians beat and bloody your family, those that they leave behind, everybody else they've taken away, and you've got this guy standing in the middle of it telling you, see, this is what you deserve. Jeremiah's life did not get any better.
Do you have problems today? Yeah, of course you do. You will have terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. But until you've given that message of doom and gloom, saying, God's people, you've messed up and you've got to take your punishment, and they're so steeped in their sins that they can't see straight, You've watched your nation be crumbled by its enemy. You've watched your house burn to the ground, your church desecrated and destroyed, and witnessed the bloodshed of your family members as a result of their sin, all while trying to preach, this is God's doing. I'm not sure our problems can compare to Jeremiah's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad life. And what, what's the kicker of the whole thing? What's the cherry on top of that, that terrible Sunday is this. The people never really listened. They heard all the doom and gloom. They heard that this was their punishment and they need to take their licks. But they stopped listening after that. Just like Jesus telling his disciples over and over again that he's going to have to be arrested and beaten and mocked and hung on a cross. And they said, no, it's not going to happen to you, Jesus. No, it's not going to happen to us, Jeremiah. The disciples, the people of the southern kingdom of Judah, they stopped listening. They didn't hear the point. The point that after all this punishment, after the cross, then there's hope. Because behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, says Jeremiah to the people. The days are coming when God will make a new covenant with his people. Not like the one that Moses, Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Not those ten commandments that you have to follow that you kept messing up on, but a new covenant. One that you can't break because you're passive in the entire thing. Because it's all God and His doing in this new covenant. He will put His law on your hearts. He will forgive your iniquity and remember your sins no more. He will send His Son to take the punishment that you deserve. Jesus will be exiled to hell in your place. Jesus will shed His blood for your sin. Bloodshed is a new covenant. Listen to those words here in a few minutes. This is a new covenant in my blood. For you. For the people of Judah. See, Jeremiah's message was honest. Things are bad now and they might get worse. Today might be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, and tomorrow might be worse than that. But the days are coming, declares the Lord. Days of a new covenant. Days filled with hope and salvation. A hope and salvation that Jeremiah never got to see. Seventy years later, the exiles were released. They were able to come back to Jerusalem. They were able to rebuild their walls, their homes. Most importantly, they were able to rebuild that temple. This Christ, who 600 years after that, stood in that very same temple and proclaimed that he's the resurrection and the life. That while it took them 40 some odd years to build that temple, it took him three days to rebuild the temple that really matters. In the midst of the doom and gloom, death and destruction, the blood and tears, Jesus Christ brings hope, brings salvation, brings hope that he will come again. The days are coming, declares the Lord, that Jesus Christ will return. The prophetic message of Jeremiah will be fulfilled because on that day when Jesus Christ returns... We'll all see Jesus. All knees will bow on heaven and on earth. 
at the end of our Old Testament reading, it says that there will be a day, the days are coming when everyone will know God and His salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. There will be a day when Pastor Paul and I will be happily out of a job because nothing we will have to say is anything that people haven't heard or don't already know. And on that day, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know where you're at in your life right now. I don't know if you're going through one of those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days or very bad weeks or very bad months or years. But on this day, with a grateful heart, you can say thank you. Thank you. Even though today is bad and tomorrow might be worse, the days are coming, declares the Lord. The day will come and the day has come and the day will come again when all is fulfilled, all forgiven and made new. No more robberies to read about, no more murders, no more broken cars or flooded dishwashers, no more sin or death. For on that day, declares the Lord, all will be as he's intended it to be. And that's something to be thankful for. The knowledge of the days to come. May it bring you a peace, a peace of God which surpasses all understanding. May this peace guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Starting there on Easter, we will be able to pass the plates, but not quite yet. Plates are still in the back of the narthex as they have been. If you haven't dropped your offering on, off on the way in, please drop it off on the way out. Continue with the prayers of the church. This week in our prayers... For the past couple of months, we've been praying for Paul Lestro, who has been in the hospice. His time in hospice is over. So we pray for Vi and the rest of the family at his death. And pray for the resurrection to come. We pray for Melvin Turbach, who is Lindsay Rule's grandfather, who has just recently been admitted to hospice in East River. We pray for Bruce Prentice, who was in and out of the hospital with an infection this week, and we pray for a swift and speedy recovery. As you're able, please rise. Let us pray for ourselves, the church around the world, and all people in their various circumstances. For the church here and wherever people gather around word and sacrament, that God would move us to true repentance so that we reflect in our lives the love that he has written in on, on our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Loving Father, hear our prayer. For the clergy and lay leaders of the church, that God would help them call the repentant back, enable healing across painful divisions, and teach catechumens of all ages the message of salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy on us, O Holy Spirit that our Lord would bring about understanding across political borders between racial, generational, economic, and cultural differences and within families of all sizes and shape. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the nations and Prince of Peace, listen to our plea. For teachers and students, social workers and counselors, police and all first responders, that God keep them safe and healthy, guiding them in crises, crises and sustaining them in chronic problems. Let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, hear our prayer. For all who are in exile from home, those who have been incarcerated, and any who have not been treated with human dignity, that God would surround them with supportive individuals and organizations. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of truth, increase their patience and hope that may be together. And those near and dear to us, Lord, especially Paul and Melvin and Bruce, for all others that we name in the peace of our own hearts.
people everywhere who seek healing and peace in those known only to God, that our Lord would heal, restore, and console them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, come to their aid. These and any other thing you would have us ask you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of the bitter suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Turn now to the surface of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right, give him thanks and praise. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for in sending us your Son to die and rise for us, you not only gave us eternal salvation, but revealed to us your immeasurable love. Grant us your Holy Spirit, Father, so that we may emulate our Savior's great love and service as we respond to your grace and mercy. Strengthen us now through this sacrament of his body and blood. Grant that in the true faith we receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation. You so graciously bestowed upon us here. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship. With the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all. This cup is the New Testament or New Covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
please rise. Now this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart and live in his peace. Amen. And we pray. We give thanks to you, gracious God, that you have refreshed us in body and spirit through the gift of this sacrament. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to share your covenantal blessing and love with the people we encounter each day. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, I hope you're not having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. But if you are, take heart in this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing. Thank you again for joining us to receive the good and gracious gifts of God and to thank and praise Him for those gifts. Brings us to birthdays. Ethan, I know it's Ethan's birthday. Anybody joining Ethan on his birthday or birthday week? Was it yesterday? Okay. So, baptismal birthdays. Sarah's baptismal birthday? Awesome. Anybody else joining Sarah for a baptismal birthday? Or anniversary? Fantastic. Blessings on the rest of your week. Don't forget about midweek coming up. Our midweek Lent service, last one before Holy Week starts. Next month or next week is Palm Sunday already. So join us for that. Blessings on your week. Happy birthday, dear friends.